Well, good morning, church. Good morning. morning. Good to see you all here. Uh, many of you know that we got back from vacation and we're still trying to, I guess, recover from that. I will tell you, uh, we knew that it was a lot cooler out there. We did not know how much cooler. And I remember, I've told several people this, but we were taking out the trash, or I was taking out the trash at the place that we were staying Thursday morning before we left town. And I remember looking down at my watch and it was 67 degrees. By the time we got into Jacksboro, Thursday evening, the temperature gauge inside the car said 111. So that's almost a 50 degree swing. Now I know one was in the morning and one was in the evening, but still, that's, that's quite a change to come home to. Uh, we actually went through, uh, decided to go through Lubbock on the way back and, and stop and let the boys get out and play and eat and all that stuff. And we thought we were going to die. Uh, we're, we were not used to that. We had been in the mountains the whole week. And uh, spoiler alert, we're, we didn't die. Uh, we're here. Um, and it's good to be back with you uh, this morning. I want to say again a couple things before we get into the lesson. Number one, uh, thanks again to Joel and John L. for filling in for me while I was gone. Uh, I won't give you a name, but I have a preacher friend in this area. And I told him that some of you know, our elders were filling in for me. He said, man, your elders will fill in for you? He said, I wish my elders would do that for me. And so uh, we are privileged to have uh, men uh, in our leadership who are willing, not only to have the ability to preach, but the willingness to do so. So thank you for that. And second thing, I I've heard this rumor going around town, maybe you have heard it too, that school is starting this week. Is that true? Okay. Um, so I want us to remember what's going on with our, our school system, with all of our students, with our teachers, our counselors, our staff, our coaches. And let me challenge you with this, because this is going to be an August that is unlike any August that anybody in education has ever seen. It's anything like we have ever seen. And it's new for all of us. And so we don't know how this is going to play out, if we're going to be able to, to stay in the school building the whole year, or if we're going to have to go back to online. We don't know what's going to happen with all the virus and all this stuff. So let me challenge you with this. Would you please cover these students and these teachers and these staff and these counselors and these coaches in prayer this school year? They're going to be going through something that is unlike anything they have ever gone through. We would be praying for all of these individuals anyway, but we especially need to be mindful of them this year. So uh, we say this every year, or I say this every year for our, our students. You're not a student in Jacksboro who also happens to go to church services. You are a child of God who just happens to attend school at this phase in your life. And so we want you to be a light to those around you. And we, we wish you a good school year. We're going to be looking at, we're going to start a new series this morning. And we're going to be looking at this book of Deuteronomy. That's probably not your favorite book in the Bible. We may not look at that very often. But we're going to look at four or five weeks of Deuteronomy and some stories and some ideas that come from this book. Now, if I were to ask you, what are some really good movie sequels that you have seen? What are, what are the best movie sequels that you can think of? Well, I went and, and researched this and looked online and thought of different answers for this. And I wanted to see, because you know, I might have my opinion, you might have your opinion. But I look to see what the experts, these so-called experts say, these movie reviewers. So here's what they say are some of the best sequels. Okay? They said Terminator 2 is better than the first Terminator. Okay? Now, I will point out, I'm not advocating that you go out and watch all these movies. Okay? <laughs> I'm just telling you what the list is. So then they said The Dark Knight. This is the sequel to Batman Begins. As Heath Ledger is the Joker. Very, did very well at the box office. They said, this is one of the best sequels of all time. They also said, surprisingly, Toy Story 2. That that was better than the first Toy Story. Now, for all these really good sequels, we also have some really bad ones. And so we have Jaws the Revenge. Anybody seen that one? They said that one is just horrible. Okay? It's laughable how bad it is. Caddyshack 2 also made the list. Of one of the worst sequels ever made. And then this, just the title alone on this one makes me cringe. Speed 2 Cruise Control. Okay? If you ever saw the first Speed, then you 
I don't know if you saw the second one, but you might want to avoid it. So these are some sequels that we see uh, out there in the movie industry. And when we talk about Deuteronomy, we're talking about a second installment of something that has already occurred. That Moses is giving the law to a new set, a new generation of Israelites. And even if you don't want to think of movies, if you think about TV, you ever watch uh, your favorite TV series, and you're getting towards the end of the episode, and they haven't really you know, figured out who the killer is yet, or, or whatever it is that you're watching, and you go, man, they only got two or three minutes left. There's no way they're going to be able to, to figure this out in the next two or three minutes. And you're dreading it, and you're dreading it, and finally it pops up on the screen, and it says, to be continued. And you're like, oh, you've got to wait a whole week. So then you go back the next week, and you start watching it again, and it'll say, previously on, and it gets you caught up with where you were. And so when we look at Deuteronomy, that's what Moses is doing here. He's, he's getting them caught up on their history and their covenant, and he's explaining to them where they come from, where they're going, and kind of leading them in this way. So we're going to be looking at a big chunk here in Deuteronomy chapter 1. If you want to turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 1, we're going to read a big section of this because I think it's going to help us set the stage not only for this morning, but as we go through the series, because we're going to look at how this book starts. And someone has said the best place to start is in the beginning. And so we're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 1, and we'll look here at this idea. It says, then we set out, this is Moses speaking to the Israelites, telling them their history. We set out from Horeb and went through all of that great and terrible wilderness which you saw on the way to the hill country of the Amorites. Just the Lord our God had commanded us, and we came to Kadesh Barnea. I said to you, you have come to the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is about to give us. See, the Lord your God has placed the land before you. Go up, take possession. As the Lord, the God of your fathers, has spoken to you, do not, be, do not fear or be dismayed. Then all of you approached me and said, Let us send men before us, that they may search out the land for us and bring back to us word of the way by which we should go up and the cities which we shall enter. The thing pleased me, and I took twelve of your men, one for each tribe. They turned and went up into the hill country and came to the valley of Eskel and spied it out. Then they took some of the fruit of the land in their hands and brought it down to us. And they brought us back a report and said, It is good land which the Lord our God is about to give us. Yet you were not willing to go up, but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God, and you grumbled in your tents and said, Because the Lord hates us, He has brought us out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go up? Our brethren have made our hearts melt, saying, The people are bigger and taller than we. The cities are large and fortified to heaven. And besides, we saw the sons of the Anakim there. And then I said to you, Do not be shocked, nor fear them. The Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight on your behalf, just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes, and in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you, just as a man carries his son. And all the way which you have walked until you came to this place. But for all this, you do not trust the Lord your God, who goes before you on your way to seek out a place for you to encamp in fire by night and cloud by day to show you the way in which you should be. Then the Lord heard the sound of your words. And he was very angry. And he took an oath, saying, Not one of these men... This evil generation shall see the good land which I had sworn to give to your fathers, except for Caleb. He shall see it. And to him and to his sons I will give the land on which he has set foot, because he has followed the Lord fully. And so the Lord was angry with me also in your account, saying, Not even you shall enter there. Joshua, the son of Nun, who stands before you, he shall enter there and encourage him, for he will cause Israel to inherit it. Okay, so there's a lot going on there. When we talk about this idea, as I said, Deuteronomy, Moses is getting everybody caught up to speed on their history and what's going on with this uh, nation of Israel, and he's reminding them of some things. And if we were to actually look at the word Deuteronomy and break it down, it comes from two different words, deuteros, which means second, also where we get the word deuce, okay, is two, and nomos, meaning law. And so it literally means 
second law. And it's not a new law. It's not replacing anything that Moses has said up to this point. It is simply a copy or a replica of what he's already introduced. But he's introducing it to a new generation of Israelites. And so he's going over this law again. So what we've just looked at, what Moses has given them, as we start this journey, as we go through Deuteronomy, he starts out the book by reminding them of two things. He reminds them of their history. He's telling them about their, their history as the nation of Israel. He's talking about their past. You ever met someone who, whose parents did something wrong? Maybe their father was in jail or their mother was a drug addict and you always have that, that sentiment towards that person that, you know, don't mess up like your parents did. Don't be like mom and dad. Learn from their mistakes. Be better than them. Maybe that even came from your own parents. Maybe your own parents told you, be better than me. In fact, some of the best testimonial stories that we hear from people are those who have turned their lives around and come through insurmountable odds and beaten the things of their past to become better people. And so Moses is reminding them, this is what your parents and your grandparents did. And so he's reminding them of their past. And when we think about our past, our past, just like the Israelites, it can remind us. It can remind us, but it shouldn't define us. And so we need to be able to reflect on our past and learn from the mistakes of our past, but not live there, not dwell there. Moses is challenging them, this is what they did, and you can learn from that, but let's move forward. This is what's going to happen from this day moving forward. And so he reminds them of their history. He's also reminding them of this covenant. We're going to see this a lot uh, throughout the book of Deuteronomy. He's reminding them of this covenant relationship that they have with God. When you look at the word covenant, it literally means a coming together or bound together. So this is the relationship that God has with Israel, and as we'll see here in just a minute, this is the relationship that God has with us. It's a very important term. You'll see it a lot in Scripture. And so when you go to the Old Testament, you have a Hebrew word, berith. It is mentioned 280 times. When you flip over to your New Testament, you have a, a word called diatheke, and it's mentioned 33 times. And this is talking specifically about the covenant relationship that we have with God. I'll give you a couple other things about covenant, because it is sometimes a confusing uh, subject. When we talk about covenant, if you have a covenant between human parties, it's always bilateral. What I mean by that is you and I, if we were to enter into a covenant with one another, there are stipulations, there are things that each of us say that we are going to do. And if I don't do my part, then you're not required to do your part. Because we can make that agreement. It's bilateral. We, we can both add to it. We can both change it. We can have our say because it's a covenant between you and me. When we look at covenant between God and man... It's unilateral, meaning you and I can't add anything to our covenant with God. God has established the covenant. We didn't. God established the covenant with us, and He allows us to be partakers in that covenant relationship. We can't add to it. We can't change. We, we don't get a vote. We don't say, God, I'd really like it if we're going to be in a covenant relationship together, if we could do this instead. We don't get a say. It's very one-sided in that way. And so we are just recipients and not contributors to this covenant with God. This is based on, if you were an Israelite back in that day, you understood this idea. It's what is called a suzerainty uh, covenant. And you would always have a vassal and a lord. And the vassal was always lower than the king or the prince, right? So it was always between unequal partners. It's the same way with us and God. We are in an unequal relationship. And the reason is the covenant was established through the price of our sin. Can you or I pay for that price? No. Only God can pay for that price. And so we are always going to be unequal in our relationship with God. Here's what I want us to think about and remember this morning. 
you and I as Christians, if we are in a covenant relationship with God, that requires commitment from us. You can't go into it half-heartedly. You can't say, well, you know, sometimes I'll be a Christian, other times I won't when it's convenient. You won't just show up on Sunday and then say you're a Christian and the rest of the week live like everybody else in the world. If you're going to be in a covenant with God, it is serious business. And it requires commitment on your part. So I want to go through some different covenants, the main covenants that we see in the Bible. I'll just point these out to you so you kind of get a better understanding of what's going on when we talk about this word covenant. So we're going to start in the Old Testament and we're going to look at the covenants that are mentioned there. The first covenant that we see explicitly mentioned is that that God has with Noah. And so the covenant is, he tells Noah, I'm never again going to, to wipe everybody out through a flood. And he also gives a sign of the covenant. He says, this is going to be the reminder of this covenant that I have made with you. And every time we have a covenant, we see a sign of the covenant. It's that reminder that God has made this agreement with man. Now, I talked about a man-to-man or woman-to-woman covenant. And when we have a man-to-man covenant, a, a bilateral covenant, the sign in those days, not all the time, but what they would do, and this is kind of disgusting, they would cut up an animal and divide it. And as you made your pledge to that other person, you would walk through that animal. And you were saying, if I don't do what I have said that I am going to do, may what happened to me be what has happened to this animal. So it was a very serious thing to make a covenant with another person. And that was the sign of the covenant. The sign of the covenant that God has with Noah is, of course, the rainbow. He says, when you see the rainbow, you're going to remember, I made this covenant with you. Then we go into this covenant with Abraham. He says, all the nations on earth are going to be blessed through you. And Paul will point out later in Romans, it's not just Jew, but also Gentile. Everybody's going to be blessed. And the sign of the circum- circumcision is the sign of the, the covenant here. This is going to be the sign that I made this covenant with you, that you are my people. Uh, with Moses, this is the one that we're looking at in Deuteronomy. He says that Israel is going to be God's chosen people. He says, you are special. I've picked you. You are my nation. You are my people. You're going to be different than everybody else, every other nation around you. And there's a lot of different signs with this. We have the Ten Commandments, obviously, as a sign that God has entered this covenant with man. Uh, we have the, the cloud and the fire that follows them, that leads them. And so we have these different signs uh, of the covenant. And we go into this covenant that God has with David. He tells him that a royal descendant, a savior, a messiah, is going to come from your family, from your lineage. And so throughout Scripture, we see that that covenant is being uh, kept by God. He always has someone on the throne that comes from the family of David and eventually, eventually leads to Jesus. There's a lot of different things that point to the covenant that you and I have. These are all the Old Testament covenants main ones. Um, But there's a lot of other books, mainly prophetic books, that talk about and speak to a new covenant. A covenant that you and I enjoy today. So one of these instances here is in Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah points this out. God says, Behold, days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah And not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day, I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, by covenant which they broke. Although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. So he introduces, he announces a new covenant. Not like any of the covenants that they had known before. And this new covenant extends... To us, And so when we talk about a covenant relationship, you and I have this privilege. We have this relationship with God. And it covers anybody who's willing to accept it. 
Anybody who wants to be in relationship with God can enter into this covenant relationship with Him. You notice how he mentions that the Israelites broke their covenant. He said, yet I was like a husband to you. That's something that we see throughout all these covenants. We, we talked about it being unilateral. That even if I, you and I mess up and we don't keep our side of the covenant, God is not going to lie. God is faithful. And He's going to keep His end of the covenant no matter what. And so God is faithful. He has created this covenant relationship, but it's up to us to accept it. And of course, the sign of our covenant, this reminder, this road point we can go back to and look at is our baptism. That reminds us. We think of our baptism when we say, I entered into a relationship with God when I was baptized. And so this is our sign of the covenant. There's a lot of verses that talk about this new covenant, how it's better, how it, you know, obviously it's new. I'll give you one of these, Hebrews 8. Now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, speaking about the one with Moses, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. When he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. So he says it's more excellent. It's better. A couple different times he says it's better. Folks, this is the covenant that we have with God. I don't know about you. I'm thankful that we are not in the old covenants. That's, a, that's really tough to keep up with. It's hard to do all these things, all the, the rituals and the practices. And God says, this covenant with you, it's better. This new covenant is better. And that's the covenant that you and I have with God. I'm going to challenge you with this because I, I hear people say this all the time. They say, you know, God is the most important thing in my life. <clears throat> You ever heard that before? God is the most important relationship uh, in my life. And yes, your relationship with God should be the most important thing in your life. Nothing should get in the way of that. Is that something you just say? Or is that something that you actually live? Because I can say that God is the most important thing to me all day long. But am I living like that? Or am I allowing other things to get in the way of my relationship with God? I'm reminded of what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, if your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you, for it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it's better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. What he's saying is everything is expendable for your covenant relationship with God. If anything gets in the way, and he's not saying literally do these things. He's giving this example. If anything gets in the way of your relationship with me, Jesus says, get rid of it. And I wonder if we have that kind of commitment that it takes to be in a covenant relationship with God. Because when we talk about this covenant, what Moses is telling the Israelites is he's saying, all that's required from you is obedience. And don't be like your parents. They're not entering the promised land. Why? Because they were disobedient. And that's hard for us, is it not? It's hard for us to always be obedient to God. And yet, that's what our covenant calls for. We can't alter it. We can't add to it. We can't change it. It is a gift from God. It is the grace of God. This is what establishes this covenant with us. And so we have to accept it. And all God is requiring, is all He ever required from the Israelites, is simply obedience. Are we living the way that God would want us to live? I'm not going to tell you that your disobedience is going to, to lead you to wandering around for 40 years in the desert. But your disobedience to God is not going to put you where you want to be. <clears throat> because at the very end of it, when it's all said and done, it's your direction and not your intention that's going to de determine where you end up. 
And so we can say all day long, yes, God is the most important thing in my life, but are you living that way? Are you really living that way to follow God? Your disobedience, yeah, you may not wander around in, for 40 years in the desert, but you might wander around for 40 years in your life. You might waste 20, 30, 40 years of your life in disobedience. And you're not going to like where you end up. I'll give you this example. I won't mention these places to you, but uh, starting in college, I went around and, and did a lot of um, fill-in preaching, a lot of part-time preaching in all over different parts of Oklahoma. And it was amazing to me how I would go in, in some places I'd, I'd be there for an extended period of time, other places it'd just be once or twice as a fill-in. But it was amazing to me. I would, I would teach a Bible class and I would ask people to turn to a certain book in the Bible. And it was amazing to me how there was always at least one person in that class who had no idea what book I was talking about. And I'm not talking about what we might consider an obscure minor prophet or something like that. I'm talking about a book in your New Testament, a gospel. And I'm saying, hey, turn in your Bibles to such and such book. And you have a lady who is fumbling through and going to the index and the table of contents because she can't find Luke. Now, I'm not going to tell you that when you get to heaven that that's going to pre be a prerequisite to get in, that you know all the books in your Bible. What I am going to tell you is if God matters to you, if your relationship to God is the most important thing, then there should be some signs that you're growing. There should be some signs that you're maturing in your faith. Because when you want something bad enough, you're going to seek it out. If you want something bad enough, you're going to make a way. And if you don't, you're going to make an excuse. And I've told you this before. I have seen, you have seen, 60, 70, 80, 90 year old people sitting in church service who are babes in Christ. How does that happen? It's because they say, God is the most important thing in the world to me. And they don't live anywhere near that standard. If God is the most important thing to you, if your relationship to God is the most important thing to you, then you should be putting in that effort. You should be trying to be obedient. Jesus will say in Luke 10, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength with all of your mind. Jesus gave His all to establish a covenant relationship with you. Are you giving your all in your relationship with Him? Because again, if we're going to be in covenant with God, it's going to require commitment on our part. So let me just end with this. This will be our challenge uh, for the week. If you say... If you're one of those people this morning, you can say, you know what? God is the most important thing in my life. Okay? Prove it. My covenant with God is the most meaningful relationship I have. There is nothing more important to me than me glorifying and honoring God. Prove it. Prove that the most important thing to you, you are striving to make the most important thing. Let's pray together, please. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the time that we can come together and worship you to gather around the table and be reminded of this great sacrifice. That great sacrifice that was required for us to have relationship with you. Father, we will never understand that love. We will never understand the links that you would go to for us. But we are thankful. We are grateful this morning that through the sacrifice of Christ, we can have relationship with you. Father, we all stumble. We all fall down. We all sin. And though we stumble in many ways, Father, we, we know that in the big picture, 
over the course of our lives, we should see some effort being put forth in our relationship with You. Yes, we're going to stumble. Yes, we're going to fall. But Father, help us this week. For those of us who say that You are the most important thing in our life, Father, help us to live that way. Help, us, help our lives to reflect our words. Help us to understand this covenant relationship that we have with You. And Father, help us to not be like the Israelites who lived in disobedience. Father, You have great, done great and wonderful things for us. And Father, may our lives be a way of thanking You as we live in obedience to You and Your will. Father, be with us this week. Help us to be good examples to those around us. We pray especially for those who are going back to school this week, for our students, for our teachers, our counselors, our coaches, our staff. Father, be with them and bless them this school year. No matter what, what comes our way this school year, Father, help them to have the resolve and the strength to push through it. Help us to continue to reach out to them and to pray for them, and to be mindful of them this school year. We ask that you bless uh, all those who are going back to school this year. Father, again, we thank you and we love you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs>